Good afternoon and welcome back. My name is John Bader, the Executive Director of the Fulbright Association. Our next panel is the penultimate of this three-day virtual conference, giving me one last opportunity to thank people who have made this whole thing a great success. First, thanks to our conference attendees, all of you, whose engagement in chat rooms, Q&A, and coffee breaks has been terrific. Uh, we know, however, that you are looking forward to next year's in-person conference. Yes, in-person, we hope uh, uh, and, and plan, uh, which we are now planning, and we will announce in the coming months. Please consider joining us as we host a Fulbright family reunion. Sooner than that, on December 8th at 2 p.m., we hope that you'll join us for our annual membership meeting, which will be online. Uh, we will be sending details in the next EDGE newsletter. Next, I, I must thank all of our terrific panelists, speakers, presenters, moderators, everyone who's participated uh, and sharing their great content with you. Their expertise, energy, and passion has challenged us to learn, to consider, and to take action. The conference would not be possible without some other key players. My colleague Munir Sayeh produced this conference and is the rock star that everyone has relied upon, including myself. Rob Lively was the program chair and also served as a great moderator on many panels. Joe Vittoni organized the virtual art exhibit and panel, which was energizing and inspiring. Do visit the exhibit hall website to purchase art that will support both the artists and this association. Alice Blumenfeld shared the Selma Jean Cohen selection and you've been just enjoyed just shortly ago, the presentation and lecture by uh, Dana Taisung Burgess, who was wonderful and whose talk on Michio Ito was so powerful and so topical for our time. And Didi Long chairs our national board. So many thanks to uh, our board members for their continuing support. We cannot offer programs like this without the financial support of our members, both individuals, like all of you, and institutions. Please see the list of institutions in the conference uh, program and online, and then help us to recruit your institution if they're not there. We also rely on the generosity of so many donors, from those who give us $5 to those who give us $25,000 or more, and many who include uh, us in their plan giving, which is very important. Please go to Fulbright.org to give before the end of the year. There you'll also see uh, our Fulbright store, which has many wonderful things, including shirts like this one, uh, and the 75th anniversary commemorative album that Superstar Munir put together. Finally, I wanna thank our generous sponsors, Rice University, the Cinema and Media Studies Program at the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Alabama, Auburn University, the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department, the National Peace Corps Association, and former board president Manfred Phillip for funding the Young Professionals Scholarship. Now, uh, to our extraordinary panel on education, which makes sense. This education is the central mission and industry of our talented and impactful community here and abroad. So let me briefly introduce those folks before we start off with Clara. Clara Amador Langster will speak on bilingual education in three countries. Uh, Sarah Cullop will discuss the challenges that students face when integrating into a new culture, in this case, the Netherlands. Santiago Lopez will share his experience in supporting teachers in Colombia. Yasser Saeed Natur looks at the efficiency, or excuse me, the efficacy of speech teletherapy in Jordan in this era of COVID. And finally, Christopher Thron will explain his role in institution building in African universities. So let's get started with Clara. Clara, you are on and good to go. So go ahead and share your video and share your uh, screen if, if you have a presentation you'd like to share with the rest of us. Yes, we can. We can hear you. Speak a little louder, but I think we're good to go. Yeah, I just want to make sure you can hear me because I'm having difficulties with audio. So you can hear me? Yeah, the audio is a little faint. I'll grant you that. Okay, because I have, I am at the top of the 100 scale 
and I'm also uh, I just check my I just check my uh, audio here, and I'm at a hundred. I'm, I'm at the top. So uh, can you hear me then? I can hear you uh, well enough. Uh, okay. it, we'll try to fix that on this end as well. But and go ahead and hit the slide uh, okay. um, slideshow on your that? end, and we're good to go. Okay. Well, good good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, <coughs> excuse me. My name is Clara Amador Langster. I am currently a, a professor, a full professor at National University, uh, where we work all over the state of California. And it is an honor to be here this morning with all of you and to be able to share some of what I have learned as a Fulbrighter. I am a Fulbright um, senior specialist um, for the US government since 2010. I've had several projects, I've had three projects in Colombia, and now I have a project in India. But what brings me here today uh, for all of you is uh, to just share with you a little bit about my work in the area of bilingual dual language education policies in both in three countries, in three parts of the world, California, part of the United States, Costa Rica, and Colombia. Uh, my work in Costa Rica has, uh, is, um, has begun in the last couple of years where I'm working with a group of uh, researchers in Universidad Nacional. Uh, the Costa Rica, and so I'm going to be looking at educational policies on all uh, on all three countries. So let me. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to begin by just uh, speaking uh, broadly in broad terms about the fact that when you're looking at global policy parameters of bilingualism, you're going to find that there are countries and parts of the world that have and, uh, and have adopted expanding language policies, and there are those that have actually. Um, um, uh, adopted restrictive language policies. And in that space, what, what you know, the parameters really speak to, and expanding language policy is something that allows a country to celebrate the multiple languages as assets, as cultural and um, intellectual capital versus those countries where the restrictive language policy views the language as a problem and as a threat. So <clears throat> I'm going to be looking at Costa Rica, Colombia, and California. And interestingly enough, um, I have been working in California as a first generation immigrant for the last 30 years, and in Colombia on three or four several projects uh, working with the Universidad de los Andes, the Universidad de la Sabana, the Universidad de la Salle, uh, and um, in La Guajira, as well as uh, other parts of Colombia, in Costa Rica doing the research study on literacy, looking at the teaching of early literacy for uh, early childhood education. And so my experiences have been different and they are going to be looked at from the perspective of um, when we're looking at the uh, framework that uh, Richard Ruiz uh, brings, he talks to us about language as a resource, language as a right, or language as a problem. And I'm gonna use this analytical lens to look at the practices of educational language policy in these three regions of the world. Is the language treated as a resource? Is it treated as a right? Or is it treated as a problem? Or is there an overlap between a right and a resource or a right and a problem or all three of them. So looking at uh, language as a, um, I'm sorry, looking language as a resource in Costa Rica, what I, I'm finding is that looking at these components of the work of Ruiz and Holt, uh, we find that in Costa Rica, languages are viewed as a resource for everyone, not only for language minority students, primarily have an exclusive value or purpose for national security, diplomacy, military action, business and media. Uh, language have, you know, somewhat of an intrinsic value and the academic programs focus on lifelong learning and multi multilingualism. I only underline those areas because those are the most prominent areas for the reality of Costa Rica, which as a country is focusing primarily on la promoción de, um, la promoción de idiomas. Uh, there is a whole educational policy that speaks to hacia una Costa Rica bilingüe, uh, this uh, particular uh, positioning in terms of ed policy looks at principles of educational policy in the fostering and promotion of uh, different languages. And they're looking at utilizing educational policy principles that speak to solidarity, uh, responsible um, uh, citizenship, uh, the fostering of uh, peaceful uh, you know, cohabitation and living among people in Costa Rica and quality. So they're looking at those different principles from the Ministerio de Educación Pública which is obviously one of their, you know, it is their uh, governmental agency for as a minister of education. Uh, their uh, whole entire idea is they want to promote the acquisition of foreign languages to help students develop the uh, competencies and the, and the learning that are necessary to 
uh, be able to communicate in a second language. Now, interestingly enough, they do not differentiate between second language and foreign language, even though we know that there are some significant differences, including, for example, English as a second language versus treating English as a foreign language. So they're looking at uh, the acquisition of English or a second language as an entry into the globalized world uh, for both uh, economic integration, political integration, and so on. I'm not going to read all of these uh, objectives for you, but just to give you an idea that the actual Ministry of Education, Ministry of Educación Pública, looks at uh, utilizing the second language as a way. They want to obviously uh, open up the opportunity for all uh, Costa Ricans. They want to obviously grant the community and especially the, 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 the in-service and pre-service teachers, the methodology and the resources that they need to teach uh, adequately. They want to obviously um, develop the professional understanding of teachers, which in many cases, which happens actually in a very pervasive way in both Central America and Latin America, where uh, uh, many of our teachers that are foreign language teachers or second language teachers do not have high levels of proficiency in the target language. And then the governments have made decisions to bring native speakers of other countries that have absolutely no preparation on second language pedagogy or second language methodology. So it is one of those recurring situations and problems that are not resolved. Es como se diría en español una sardina que se muerde la cola. In terms of the actual, um, it's the, the problem is that we do not have either native speakers that know how to teach a second language. And then when we have teachers in Colombia that may know a little bit about second language methodology, they do not have the language proficiency. And this is Colombia and this is Costa Rica. Uh, they have developed a, a, an action plan from 2021 to 2040 uh, that has you know, five uh, strategic um, um, uh, lineations for, for action. Uh, these are all highly bureaucratic and I know that many of us may not read Spanish and that's okay. I wanted to just bring this to the, to the discussion because many of these are, again, um, representing the top-down structure of highly bureaucratized and highly institutionalized governments that literally top-down uh, delineate what the country will do without a true understanding of what is the contextually situated reality of Costa Ricans or Colombians in terms of how they are prepared already or not to learn a second language or a foreign language. Um, in the United States, for example, and now it was shifting to California and was shifting to the United States, our language policy is very brief. We have a very brief history of our language policy. There's really no official language policy at a federal level in the United States. Uh, we have 50 states with 50 variations of language policy, and we have this dichotomy between language acquisition and learning at school. But we're going to find that in California, and particularly and in other states in the union, we have had a restrictive language policy as evidenced by promotion of English only policies that do not, uh, do not accept or do not um, establish the legitimacy of other languages spoken in this nation. Even though just in California alone, we have students that speak over 120 languages, uh, the hegemony of English is, is, is very pervasive. So we've had, as you know, in California, we had Prop 57 in 1998, which was the dismantling of an English education and dual language programs as we knew them after the last 20 years. We had Arizona Proposition 302, which did exactly the same in Arizona. The same applied to Massachusetts. And the US DOE, the US Department of Education, actually moved us from the Office of Bilingual Education and Multi Multicultural Language to the Office of English Language Acquisition, which showed the shift to, again, positioning English-only policies at the heart of the work in the United States. And so in uh, California, in, in, in the United States, language is really a problem. It is not a resource, it's not viewed as a resource or a right, it's viewed as a problem. And so monolingualism is a dominant majority language, in a dominant language is valued, in this case, English. The policy seeks to limit or eliminate multilingualism. Even though we have incredible language diversity and language uh, and multi multilingual uh, environments, the language diversity is a threat to assimilation and national unity. And so you can see I have actually underlined some of the principles that uh, constitute the situation that we currently have in California and many other states. Now I'm focusing in California, which is one of the most progressive states in language learning and language policy, even though we've had some major um, setbacks. But all of these different statements that we recognize as language as a problem uh, clearly uh, creates a situation for this country that is, you know, in, in many ways, the educational policy and the language policy promotes monolingualism. One of the most pervasive and dangerous uh, results of viewing language as a problem is that uh, English language proficiency has been equated um, 
to cognitive ability. And even though this is not explicit in any governmental document or in any particular teacher ed program or in any credentialing program, those of us who are in the field and have um, been both bilingual teachers, second language teachers, English learners, we see that there is an, uh, an underlying assumption that really positions the English language learner in a situation of discrimination in terms of their uh, denial of their language rights. And we look at examples of linguicism uh, also mediated by racism. And so the United States, in, in particular in California, has looked at responding to the fact that we have large numbers of uh, students. We have 1.6 million English learners in the state of California that are also speakers, 80% of them are speakers of Spanish, of different national dialects of Spanish across the state, as well as many other minority languages. And so we have responded with transitional bilingual programs, developmental bilingual, one-way immersion, two-way immersion, uh, 1910 uh, models, 5050 models, heritage language programs. But again, we have advanced three steps and then sometimes we go back four because of the regressive nature of the language policies that we have. So we have had students that have been obviously not served in their use of black English. That's a whole other discussion. Students that have not been served in their use of their heritage language or their mother tongue. Uh, we have students that have not been able to achieve at high levels of academic proficiency in a second language because their native language, their mother tongue has been suppressed and has been oppressed. So bilingual education in California is shifting in 2016, Proposition 58 passed, and this is the California Multilingual Education Act of 2016, where the English, uh, where, where we removed literally Proposition 227, and in this particular case, um, uh, schools and parents can actually uh, um, you know, have flexibility to provide multilingual uh, programs and bilingual programs in a level we've never seen before. Since 2016, we have experienced uh, some real challenges in that we have seen a huge growth of bilingual program implementation across the state. We do not, however, have many bilingual teacher preparation programs because they were all dismantled since the passing of Proposition 227 in 1998. We have a severe, severe uh, shortage of bilingual teachers in the state. Uh, we have a huge demand because now we have more bilingual programs and more dual language programs we've ever had before. And we also are seeing an, a, a, a blossoming of one-way immersion programs and heritage language programs across the state. So we are in, a, in an open space right now where we're finding that um, California is really beginning to, uh, beginning to open up the policy door to the implementation of new bilingual programs. And in my case, as director, of a, a, uh, of a large statewide bilingual education program for teachers and looking at huge demand across the state. Colombia, and, and please let me know about time because I know that I have 10 minutes and you need to you let me know about time. Um, in Colombia, language is viewed also as a resource similarly to Costa Rica. Uh, and in many cases, what we see is that we find that the, the, the value of language as an asset is viewed from the perspective of the employment opportunities and integration to the global community that language gives. However, the Ministerio de Educación Nacional in Colombia has not really, uh, really truly surveyed the field in terms of the needs of teachers, of the needs of foreign language teachers or second language teachers in the context of their public school system. So you see that some of the areas that are underlined specify the fact that- Dr. Clara, you are, you are, you are running over, uh, if you could wrap it up. I'm running over, okay. So I will just finish here. Um, I, was just, I was just going to say that in Colombia, uh, we find that uh, English is viewed as a, as a foreign language, is viewed as a second language, and then we have also have the whole area of emeducación. Um, I wanted to just finish by saying that um, in all three parts of the world, what we find is that in countries like both Costa Rica and Colombia, language is viewed as a resource that will uh, favor you know, economic growth and integration to global community, and that's all to be discussed. In California, however, is viewed as a problem and a threat against the hegemony of English. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Um, I wanted to uh, tell everyone, uh, all the attendees, uh, that it's it'd be really wonderful if you could use the Q and A uh, uh, feature at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for Clara and any other any of the um, uh, coming uh, presenters. We'll get to the questions at the end, but if you could submit them as we go along. Um, I'll be reading them and feeding them to our panelists uh, when we're when we're done. So please use the Q and A feature for that. In the in the chat function, you're welcome to introduce yourselves and share other thoughts. Uh, so we, we look forward to to that. Uh, our next presenter is Sarah. If you're 
ready to go, Sarah. Um, please share your screen, share your video, and share your volume when you've got a second. Okay. All right. Are you hear me? I we can hear you. Yes, and we I can see your screen too. So you're good to go. All right, great. Um, a lot of what I'll be talking about is actually very uh, relevant and related to what Dr. Clara was talking about. Um, my name is Sarah Cullop, and I will be presenting the findings of my master dissertation research at the University of Edinburgh, um, titled Double Dutch, a language focused case study on the bridges and barriers to newcomer student integration in the Netherlands. I'd like to start with a, a few definitions. Um, first, when I use the term newcomer, I'm referring to someone who has recently arrived in a place that could be forced or unforced migrants or refugees, for example. Uh, mainstream education, that's self-explanatory, general public school education. Reception education, however, is a specific initial education for newcomers, often referred to as welcome or introduction classes. And this is typically geared toward language learning of the national language or competency and literacy mapping. Um, now, most importantly, probably, is this acronym EOA, and that is Dutch for Eerste Opvang Anderstaligen, which translates to the first intake for foreign speakers. This is the name of all Dutch reception schools. EOA schools. I'll be referring to that throughout the presentation. Now, language education policy, building off of what Dr. Clara already sold us. These are policies that inform the ways in which languages should be taught, learned, used, and assessed in education. Next is NT2. That is the equivalent of ESL. That's Dutch as a second language, um, or Nederlands als tweede taal. And finally, a language profile is someone's personal history of language learning and use. So I'll be referring to these terms throughout. Uh, now, why? Why is this even important? Well, um, you may be aware that there are, at the end of 2020, there were 82.4 million people uh, worldwide who were displaced. And specifically in the EU or in the European context, uh, the number of asylum seekers and refugees uh, increased drastically in the year 2015, um, largely in response to the crisis in Syria. And so the integration of the youth among them is, of course, very relevant and applicable for EU law. So that's why I've looked into this. Um, my research questions were threefold. First, what are the experiences of a newcomer student in the EOA reception schools? To, second, how do EOA teachers perceive newcomer, newcomer students' language profiles and identities? And thirdly, how could teaching and learning for newcomer students in the Netherlands be improved. Um, to situate this research, I have a visual of the snakes and ladders of the Dutch education system here. Um, I'd like to just draw your attention first to the fact that primary education in the Netherlands lasts eight years, after which time students are tracked into three major tracks, namely pre-university education, general secondary education, and pre-vocational secondary education. Now, if you take a look at the yellow boxes, you'll see that newcomers that arrive under the age of 12 are integrated directly into primary education, whereas newcomers between the ages of 12 and 18 uh, attend a separate school or a withdrawal model, which is a friendly way of saying a segregated school, um, for a duration of a maximum four years or until students reach A2 proficiency on the Common European Framework for Reference Scale in Dutch, and at which time they're considered ready to enter one of these three major tracks. Um, just to speak briefly about my research design and participants, this is a case study whereby the unit under investigation is EOA schools. And this I looked at from two perspectives, that of a former student and of three current teachers by way of semi-structured interviews. Uh, if you have any questions about the research design or the theoretical framework, we can address those in the Q&A. But for the sake of time, I'll move on and draw your attention to this quote that jumped from the data from the student, an Arabic, a Syrian Arabic proverb that says, tell me how many languages you speak, and I will tell you how many characters you have. Uh, and this speaks to the deep entanglement between language and identity. I thought that was a beautiful quote from the student to share. Getting right into the results. Um, 
And in, in response to the first research question, the students had a negative experience in the EOA reception education context. And this was brought about by a few factors. The first of all, the duration of stay. Uh, I can summarize this data for you, but I can also show you the direct quote from the student himself. And he said he wanted to leave as soon as possible because it's separate from the outside community and you don't meet any people from the Dutch, he said. Um, and you see a conflicting perception on part of the teachers. Uh, where they think that this uh, the duration of two years, previously it was two years they could stay, but in response to COVID-19, the government has extended that separation to four years. Um, so the data that the, the teachers are talking about is, is in reference to that two-year rule still, where, two, where students can spend up to two years in reception education. The teacher says, if you're normally intelligent, controversial uh, claim here, I know, uh, if you're familiar with the school environments and if you don't have psychological baggage, uh, then you can achieve A2 level proficiency in two years. But if you don't have, have all of that, then it's way too short. So you see the student wants to leave as soon as possible and the teacher says it's not long enough. Another contributing factor to the negative student experience was low expectations for newcomer students. The student said, uh, gave an anecdote of a math class where the teacher was teaching one plus one and he said, it's not our level. And she said, it is your level because it's your level of language. So we see this failure to separate content area knowledge uh, and Dutch language knowledge. Um, and as the student says, this is not acceptable. I think that speaks for itself. Uh, another kind of um, revealing quote from a teacher is an unbased assumption of students' educational backgrounds. The teacher said, those who leave a country in conflict first, those are the intellectuals and those that leave later have little or less education. And this unbased uh, assumption will feed into the teacher's um, expectations for a learner. And we can see that that's very clearly harmful. Finally, uh, the negative student experience at the AOR was, uh, EOA, excuse me, um, is contributed by the insufficient teacher education and training for this target group of learners. Uh, the teachers admitted this themselves saying that sometimes people are hired who don't have a teaching degree in Dutch and you notice that this has a negative impact on students, obviously. Um, so yeah, I don't think I need to say anything more about that. The second conclusion from my results that was drawn is prevailing assimilationist and monolingual ideologies in teaching newcomers. And this is very relevant and related to what Dr. Claire was talking about. What I wish it said here was prevailing integrationist and multilingual ideologies. Um, however, it doesn't. And that was shown through deficit views of multilingualism, exactly what Dr. Clara was saying, seeing home languages as a barrier rather than a bridge or um, um, a barrier rather than a resource or a tool for Dutch acquisition. The students said, I tried to use my language Arabic to translate Dutch, but it was forbidden. And this is, a ver this is way too neo-colonial for my liking, <laughs> um, this kind of thing. Um, even if the student wanted to listen to music to focus on his study, he didn't know any Dutch songs, so he listened to Arabic and he was told to shut it down because he needs to learn Dutch. So listen to Dutch. To be honest, I would rather listen to Arabic music than Dutch music as well. <laughs> uh, but he doesn't know any Dutch songs. How can you expect? Anyway, very problematic, speaks for itself. Um, another, another aspect of these assimilationist and monolingual ideologies came through teachers' attitudes towards students' home cultures and identities. Um, the student, when asked how much space is there for your home culture and for your for your multiple identities, he said, oh, no, no, no. The main thing we should do is learn Dutch language and Dutch culture. Uh, we can't share our culture because it's uh, not important, as that was his perception. And um, <laughs> the teacher, however, identified their multi culty day. We're all familiar with such an approach. Um, as including students' home cultures, where they said everyone can make a recipe from their own country or they can perform like a song or dance. <laughs> and um, I think we're all familiar with this multi culty elevating uh, minorities' home cultures and identities just for one day, just for one day, instead of making it as part of our everyday teaching practice. Um, this, this is very performative, it's essentialist, it's tokenistic, and all of those things are problematic. <laughs> However, on a lighter note, a more positive note, one teacher did acknowledge Ramadan and she did not eat or drink in front of students during that time. And the student says, I felt so good because she did it. She don't have to do it, but she did it anyways. And these kind of things that encourage you to stay at that school actually 
So we can see how powerful this acknowledgement of culture was for the student in this reception education. Finally, the third uh, conclusion that was drawn from my results, there are conflicting perceptions between teachers and students of what effective and equitable integration looks like, mainly between inclusion versus exclusion in mainstream. The student is on the side of inclusion, taking an approach more like the US or the UK, uh, where newcomers are integrated into the mainstream, given language support, given other types of support. Uh, this is what the student would like. However, the teachers found it more important that students first attend in a segregated place, uh, the EOA school to learn Dutch before being integrated into the mainstream. And I can't include all the data or all the quotes that I have, which I'd like to include, but for the sake of time, I'll keep moving. Finally, the last bit that I have for you is a pipeline problem between the EOA schools and the lowest level of um, mainstream education in the Netherlands. The student acknowledges this when he says, after one or two years, they'll ask you, do you want to stay here or do you want to go to a low level Dutch school? And I would say, well, all the ways are not good. Well, he's, he's absolutely right. Um, the teacher also acknowledges this saying some used to go to pre-university education or the general secondary education track, but now it's becoming less and less. It's only a few who go, which indicates that the majority is being tracked into the lowest level. And the teacher even, one of the teachers acknowledges this saying they're sent to something that's not suitable for them uh, based on language proficiency. And that I find a very big problem and I do as well. So to draw your attention back to the snakes and ladders of the education system, what we're seeing is students from the new from the EOA directly into the lowest level track or indeed practical education or indeed special education, something that is often and uh, not suitable for the student. So to wrap it up and bring it back to the research questions, the experiences of a newcomer student were often negative, patronizing and discriminatory. How can how did teachers perceive these languages profiles and identities? Well, with primarily deficit views of multilingualism, they failed to make use of home language resources, enacted Dutch only language policies and conveyed essentialist views towards students home cultures. Therefore, these identities were dismissed and denied rather than acknowledged and affirmed. And finally, how can teaching and learning be improved? Well, <laughs> if it's not already obvious, taking a, multi, uh, taking a value added multilingual anti-racist and intercultural pedagogical approach, um, having inclusive equitable learning opportunities and support for newcomers, and, uh, and um, taking a broader theory aligned and reciprocal understanding of integration, not only into education, but also into society. This takes a very language heavy focus on integration whereby Dutch proficiency is a, is, a, is a means to an end rather than one piece of a complicated integration puzzle. So what? So the discussion, also known as the discussion, three major um, action points or areas uh, or areas for improvement are in integration and language education policy, uh, teacher education, training and professional development. And of course, these two things supported by funding and advocacy so that teachers are respectful and well-informed as opposed to well-intended in their everyday actions and interactions with newcomers in the classroom. I hope I've stuck close by the 10 minute mark. Uh, thank you for listening. And I'm happy to provide a list of references or any questions or comments I can address in the Q&A. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Uh, that was a, a lot of content in a short period of time. So <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I'm sort of glad that I'm a native English speaker because you uh, spoke so quickly. Uh, it was uh, a lot to take in. So uh, just Sorry. ironic. Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm just teasing. No worries. Um, <laughs> Uh, so thank you so, so much. That was fascinating. And in the Q&A, we're actually going to uh, unwrap some of your last two slides, which I think are the two most important. Um, and so we'll we'll get back to that uh, in all seriousness. So so thank you so much. We're sure. going to go to Santiago next. Uh, so Santiago, um, you're 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 up if you could. Uh, and if you want to share your screen, that's great. Um, and it looks like you're not on mute. So you're good to go. Okay, um, I cannot share my screen, but by the way, it looks like I don't have access to share my screen. Oh, okay, now I can. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, I could see your screen and you're okay. doing great. Off you go. 
Perfect, thank you. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Santiago Agustin. Um, I am an English teacher from Colombia, uh, where I'm currently living and from where I am presenting right now. Um, I was a Fulbright Scholar in the year of 2015 in Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon. And today I would like to, uh, first of all, thank the Fulbright Association for letting me um, be a part of this important event. And it is such a great honor to be sharing this panel with such inspiring uh, educators. Uh, in today's presentation, I would just like to share a little bit of the work that I have been doing uh, over the last year in my home country, spe specifically in Nariño, which is a region in Southwest Colombia. Um, so uh, the, after the pandemic, you know, everyone basically went uh, online to online teaching. And so this created a problem for many teachers who didn't have um, a lot of ideas or a lot of experience with teaching online. And also they lacked the, the support that they usually would get in, in a physical environment. So just by being teaching online, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you might relate to this, that it's very easy to feel like isolated or feel, feel alone, feel like you don't have support. You cannot talk to someone about what you're going through. So this was one of the reasons why um, I founded this. I founded this organization, which is called Nariño Tison Network, which is uh, the organization that I would like to talk about today. Um, and so, um, yeah, basically, um, with a couple of colleagues and friends uh, who are also English language teachers in Nariño, in Colombia we decided that it would be really interesting to have an organization in our region that would focus on professional development and as a way for us to feel supported and a way to have networking opportunities. Uh, Colombia has two major uh, organizations that do some, some, something like this, which are TISOL Colombia and the Colombian Association of English Teachers. Uh, but unfortunately, these are organizations where you have to pay you know, a membership, and usually the conferences or events are in Bogota, which are very far from Nariño. And so teachers who want to go from here to Bogota, they have to add additional costs like, you know, transportation, hotels, the registration fees, meals, everything. So for these reasons, usually many teachers, um, you know, they decide not to attend these events and they basically decide not to uh, be part of professional development opportunities such as this. And so this created a gap here in this region, and we wanted to basically uh, fill this gap and close a bridge, close a bridge in, in, in Nariño. And so that's how Nariño Tissot Network was born. Um, and basically, uh, this is who we are. We are an independent nonprofit organization. Uh, we offer a space to network and collaborate. We are a provider of professional development for English language teachers. And we are a community that advocates for and supports English language teachers in our region. Originally, we started uh, with the idea of supporting um, and creating this community in the region of Nariño. But we have received such an amazing um, support and you know, collaboration and participation from so many teachers that we have expanded our, our, our original idea because we are now a network that has teachers not only in Colombia, but also in other parts of the world, which has been amazing. Um, so the way we support our teachers is through three main programs. First of all, we offer a share and collab, which is a monthly event. It's something informal, it's similar to a workshop, so basically, uh, we choose a topic that's very relevant, very immediate in the classroom that everybody is struggling with. And then we talk about it, we share our resources, our tools, our tips, and then we discuss about ideas for addressing any problems or issues that we might enc encounter in the classroom. For instance, last month, sharing collapse topic was uh, using technology in the online English classroom. So uh, this was really interesting because we talked about how teachers have made the switch from a pre-COVID era to a mostly online teaching era. 
And as I said, you know, there are many teachers who don't have a lot of experience teaching online, who are still learning a lot. And so this was a really amazing event because everybody shared their favorite tools, their favorite websites, their favorite, uh, you know, tips and tricks and strategies for teaching online for how to keep students motivated, uh, how to bring engaging activities for students and so on. So this was a very enriching experience. Um, and everybody left with a lot of tools in their toolkits so that they can implement uh, things that they can implement you know, immediately in their English classroom. Another thing that we do is that we also, um, we are also planning our annual conference because of uh, popular opinion. Uh, this has been one of the things that we have been organizing. We plan to launch this by next year. And the last thing is an advocacy and mentorship program. This is something very special that we're working on right now. We are connecting with regional universities that offer um, language teaching programs in the undergraduate level. And so we are connecting students from these programs with professional English teachers from around Colombia who can work together. And so the mentors basically, the professional teachers basically mentor students about issues of you know, career opportunities, um, scholarship opportunities to study abroad or to work abroad and things like that. So this has received a lot of positive um, reception from you know, students and also from our members. And there are these other ways in which people can participate and get involved in our organization. Uh, you can be a participant simply, and then if you're more interested, you can become a member uh, we have a board of directors committee, so it's not just me. Uh, I have an amazing team that supports me and supports all the teachers and all the events that we have in our organization. And um, yeah, we invite people to be speakers, to be volunteers, or to be partners of our organization. For instance, so far we have successfully created three partnerships one international and two international partnerships. The first one is with ESL Library. Uh, some of you might know it because I've seen that uh, language learning and language teaching is one of the hot topics in this panel. Uh, but if you don't, ESL Library is a company from Canada that creates ready-made lesson plans and materials in digital homework and feedback tools that allow teachers to save time and teach meaningful classes every day. So Santiago, they create, uh, just a, uh, Santiago, just a two minute warning, please. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I, I have like two more slides and that's it. <laughs> Great. No worries. Yeah. And so uh, because of this uh, partnership, all our members in our organization have free access to uh, an ESL library account. And so basically, you know, uh, hundreds of teachers, hundreds of members in our organization have benefited from this. Additionally, we have also created partnerships with CISOL Colombia and ASOCOPI, which as I said, are the two major organizations for, for professional development in Colombia. And we have worked with them. They have sent people uh, to our events to be presenters, to be speakers, and they have also given us, um, you know, tickets to attend their own events. And so, yeah, that was um, that was everything. I look forward to hearing any questions or comments regarding my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Santiago. Really appreciate it, and uh, we'll follow up with some good questions afterwards. Uh, right now, we're going to go to Yasser. Uh, Yasser, you're you're on deck and uh, hey. fantastic. And do remember to share your screen if you uh, have present uh, uh, slides. Yes. Well, uh, today, uh, first, uh, let me introduce myself. I am a, a Fulbright uh, three times. I got a Fulbright scholarship. Uh, one of them was to obtain my PhD, then a Fulbright alumni, then a scholar, uh, a Fulbright scholar award. Uh, so uh, that's the, my history. Uh, I don't know why I can't 
That's a yes, sir. Yep. Go to slideshow and from beginning. From the beginning, it's all the way to the left, upper left hand corner. Oh, yes. Yes. There uh, you go. Now so, you're good. Uh, I would like to thank the Fulbright Association for giving me this opportunity. And I would like to uh, thank my partners in this uh, project in the pandemic. Uh, uh, we all share the same. Uh, motto, uh, a therapist without soul is no healer at all. I am a speech language pathologist. Uh, once the COVID-19 COVID started uh, in March 11, uh, Jordan uh, imposed a total quarantine lockdown. It, it is peculiar. It's different than any place in the world. It was one of the world's strictest lockdowns over the coronavirus, as described by, C by the CNN. So it was a total curfew. We cannot go out of the houses even to buy food until we walk, unless we walk. Uh, then my students, former students, now colleagues, uh, all of them are have graduated, began, st uh, started synchronous online speech therapy sessions. And you might be uh, surprised, speech therapy online, yes, we did it. We started at the same day of the total lockdown uh, and uh, we conducted, uh, during the total lockdown, we conducted two th 212 sessions, speech therapy sessions. Those are our, our stats. Uh, the first week, 1835, then the total was, uh, within two months, was 212 speech therapy sessions. We saw uh, uh, patients with voice disorders, articulation disorders, language delay, phonology, dysphagia even, and stuttering. Uh, we uh, did uh, we, we uh, did the online therapy sessions in multiple countries, not only in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Canada, Iraq, Ramallah, Gaza, uh, Palestine, and uh, it was around 260 sessions. Uh, those were given from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., so we were working around the clock. Uh, after the uh, total lockdown came, the partial lockdown, we did not stop. I moved to the uh, another private university, Amman Ahliya University, and started there again. Proposed the teletherapy uh, uh, initiative and was uh, immediately implemented. Uh, I and my my team and I uh, added occupational therapy to the services, then AAC services, augmentative alternative services. All the sessions were free of charge. We did not get anything. Uh, for that. Uh, those are the types of disorders that we dealt with and number of patients, uh, sometimes 93 patients, sometimes 50 patients, and we went around the clock. Uh, we used any platform that we had, uh, you name it, Zoom, Skype, uh, even Facebook Messenger. Uh, I'll, I'll now show you a, a video, a short video of uh, uh, pre-post teletherapy examples how they were before and what happened after we finished uh, teletherapy. And those are also uh, free of charge. One of them is uh, a voice loss for a teacher who lost her voice during the pandemic. The other is an, uh, a stroke patient, uh, aphasia. And the third uh, uh, is a singer with vocal modules. So please, I know that you don't know the language, but please listen. طيب عملت تنظير للاوتار الصوتيه ف يعني عملت اه مع انه انا لو لو محلك ما بعمل تنظير بس مش مشكله شو سووا ما في شيء اوتار الصوتيه بعيده عملوا تنظير للاحبال الصوتيه ما في اي شيء على الاوتار الصوتيه بس هي عدم تطابق فقط يعني لا ماشي هي رجعت يلا جرب رائع رائع جميل مزيكا كمان بكسر مغنيين بعدها يلا طيب ماما
Mama. Mama. Wow. Who's this Joseph? I need to remember. Who's that? Anna Michelle. Michelle, come on. Yalla, hey, hey, come on, Michelle. Michelle. ميشيل بابا ميشيل دب دوب دب 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 دوب بالدب بالرب هلا اول واحد منيحه المقطع الثاني دب دوب دب دوب دب دب اول كلمه بنظبطها إذا إذا استغلينا التنغيم بنصير نكرج شوي شوي ما تيأس كل إشي في بدايته صعب لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله باب باب إيهاب إيهاب في مية Let me Okay. Okay. سبت فراغ كبير عندي والله حبيبي حبيبي Yeah, sir, you just have one more minute, please. Okay, I'll, I'll finish up then. The thing is that uh, uh, we, I conducted research along with my students. It's uh, in progress. Uh, taught two graduate level courses under the total lockdown. Um, uh, we used a lot of uh, uh, online resources like uh, talk tools and so on. The advantages is privacy, time saving, low cost, overhaul, all health en enhancement. But the disadvantages were the general home setting was not organized, did not help a lot, so, especially with young kids and the instability of the internet connection. And that's it for, for my presentation today. Uh, I hope to get uh, a lot of questions. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, really appreciate that. What a miraculous work that you do. It's uh, it's quite extraordinary. I'm, I congratulate you. Uh, that family that you whose life you changed. I, I'm I'm in awe. So thank you so much, my friend. Thank um, you. Uh, let's move on, if we can, to Christopher. Christopher, you're our final um, presenter. Um, uh, go ahead and share your video and your screen as you need to. And uh, um, you've got about 10 minutes. Yeah, I don't have a video. Can you see my PowerPoint? We, yes, I can. Go ahead and hit from the beginning and you're good to go. Okay, so my topic is building the second tier of African University faculty. And uh, my Fulbright experiences have all been in Africa, Chad, Cameroon, Sudan, and Nigeria. An interesting place in the world. Uh, Chad, you may know the president was recently 
uh, killed in battle uh, in Cameroon when I first went there. I had to leave my first place because of Boko Haram. In Sudan, Sudan while I was there, uh, President Bashir, after 30 years, was deposed. So very interesting experiences. Some of my classes. And uh, for the purposes of this talk, let me define what I mean by second tier university. These are non-flagship. Flagship means the, like the principal or uh, principally regarded university in the country. And they usually get less attention from international granting organizations, often because they don't know how to apply. Uh, they're often located away from central cities. The, many students are regional. They have serious financial challenges and deficient educational backgrounds. They are underfunded, under-resourced, uh, poor infrastructure, frequent out power outages, and problems with internet. Okay, so here's some uh, pictures from different campuses. Now you can see a basic classroom, and then this was my office in University of Nagandre. I shared with two other professors and several dozens of students who came in every day, which was very nice, and very interesting, very good chance to socialize. All right. So uh, I, I would uh, summarize some challenges for second tier university pedagogy is that, the, as I said, the students are unprepared because they come from a dysfunctional secondary school system where passive learning is the, uh, is the usual and they're basically lost in the crowd. They get no individual attention. They ha don't have solid technical foundation. By the way, I should say that my area is mathematics and computer science. I should have said that at the beginning. So uh, that's, uh, so of course, technical foundation is extremely important. Uh, they learn new material without understanding. When I teach them a class, I find they don't know what they're supposed to know. They may not have memorized some things, but they don't really have intuition or math sense. It's just playing with symbols. The focus is on passing exams. Cheating is basically uh, accepted. It's helping your friend. So it's very difficult, especially when the classes are overcrowded. Uh, it's very difficult to avoid cheating. When I give out homework, I, I uh, get 30 papers, which are actually 30 copies of one paper. So it makes it a little bit difficult. Okay, dim, uh, there, and uh, there's a problem with motivation because they know that when they get a degree, it doesn't mean anything. Only, you can only get a job if you have connections or, uh, and, uh, and a true competence is not really what determines your position. All right, for faculty, often the faculty have come up through the same system. So they're underprepared and they're insecure in their knowledge. Uh, they've never had any instruction in teaching methods. Uh, they have poor background in subject matter. They have little understanding outside of some narrow domain and very little exposure to mono, modern innovations, especially computing. Computing is extremely important in mathematics and, and uh, it's kind of revolutionized the focus of the way mathematics is taught outside of these places, but they're uh, behind and kind of locked into a traditional model. Uh, the promotion system is also dysfunctional. Uh, they have to uh, produce publications where that they're, they basically have to crank out publications. Uh, it, you can kind of relate in the American uh, promotion system, but it's that uh, times, times 10. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of politics involved in promotion, uh, which does not really have to do with competence. It's very siloed. They don't regard interdisciplinary work. And, uh, it's a, and it's a bureaucratic nightmare. Um, okay, so how to address these issues? Of course, these issues are just extremely overwhelming. So I think that all I can do is do what I can do, which is cultivate personal, per, personal professional relationships. As I said, students often feel lost in the crowd. And I feel that if at least I can uh, relate personally to people uh, and foster those personal relationships, maybe I can model that and Maybe that's the best I can do uh, in, in this small amount of things that I can do. So personal professional relationships that are collaborative. Uh, so working together with people, mutually enabling. So uh, I, it's not just I'm benefiting, I'm getting benefit also. Multi-level with students, faculty and administration. I uh, kind of connect across levels. Uh, interconnected, not just within universities, but between universities and long-term. So that don't just last from the period of my visit there. So I give us some examples. So one example of such relationships are one one on one mentorships. And I've been fortunate to connect with PhD students, some formally, some informally. If you see the student on the left, that's Vienna Bezwatima. Uh, in fact, he defended his PhD yesterday, and actually on Wednesday. Very happy about that in mathematical epidemiology. And that's at uh, uh, University of Abomey Kalame in, in Benin. 
On the right, you can see Evelyn. Uh, she also defended her PhD, I think last year. Uh, she was doing a statistical analysis of malaria surveys. I didn't advise her formally, but I did uh, introduce her to R. I asked a lot, answered a lot of questions online and uh, we are good friends, all right? So, and you can see this is not just me benefiting them. I get a lot of publications out of this. This has helped my promotion. And it's been very rewarding. Really my professional life is, is focused on this, on this aspect of working with African collaborators. Um, I've also started reviewing for my, my uh, one of the faculty at uh, University of Lagos in Nigeria has started an in-house mathematics journal. They've been very active reviewing papers for that. And what often happens is I end up co-authoring the paper because the paper they submitted really is qu quite deficient. So I'll help them bring it up to publication level. All right. Uh, I've also been fortunate to uh, connect with the International Mathematicians Union, which sponsors a volunteer lectureship program. And I, I don't, I, I've lost count of how many of these I've done, probably about five or six. Uh, now I usually double up when I get one grant, I can do two uh, teaching gigs because uh, of connections. These, they sponsor three to four week short courses in, in focused mathematical subjects as requested by the universities. So I work with colleagues to deliver the classes that they need. And I focus on what I think is the biggest area of deficiency is uh, computational mathematics. So. I can kind of supply the lack of what they don't, the background they don't have. I try to model best teaching practices with interactive teaching instead of road teaching. So it's not stand and deliver at all. We do a lot of group work. I mix with the students. I, I de-emphasize lecture, lecturing. In fact, I record lectures uh, so that they can watch on their smartphones. Most people either have a smartphone or have access to a smartphone. I try to model, model mentorship. Like again, I think one of the big, big thing is that ma mathematics is kind of like uh, an apprenticeship to really learn, you have to you you have to apprentice. It's not just learning facts. It's not just learning procedures. But it's but there's there's more to it than that. It's a craft, and you have to you have to have some kind of mentorship. So I also try to introduce some simple uh, turning technologies. I use a a tablet, and I also uh, do uh, screencasting. As I said, I record my lectures. I use OneNote, which is a great tool because. As I said, people have smartphones, so I put my lectures online so they can access them. Often the blackboards or the uh, uh, screens are not visible. So uh, this is possibly the only way to make uh, the content well available to students. So here's one of my follow-up classes. This was a mathematical software class at the University of Illorin. Uh, I wrote an article for MAA Focus. MAA is Mathematical Association of America. So I wrote an article called Building Pythonic Pyramids in Nigeria. This is a class in actual practice. You can see it's kind of organized chaos. Uh, I've, I've, I think at this point I've given them some programming task and you can see not everybody has a computer. So people share, which actually works quite well. Uh, people learn from each other, they interact. I think that that active interaction really does help and uh, gets them uh, learning and interested. Okay. Uh, besides follow-up classes, I've had opportunities to speak at conferences. Uh, especially after the lockdown, I've done several online conferences. These are my two most recent. Uh, one on the left is uh, Operations Research Association of Nigeria. The one on the right is uh, from Oman. Uh, so uh, I've been talking about uh, machine learning and operations research. So I do focus on practical skills and I try to give uh, people a vision of the usefulness of what they're learning. I think there's quite a disconnect in, in the African academic community between what they're learning and what they could possibly use uh, in, in, in life outside of academia. So I try to focus on those possibilities. All right, I also have uh, had uh, long, on the levels of faculty, I have long-term collaboration with a number of people. You can see several different areas. Uh, 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 Jean-Claude Comgang, uh, do uh, ma the malaria control measures. So this is mathematical epidemiology. Uh, this is uh, kind of uh, public, Public well-being is a, a, a statistical analysis using R with Monir Ahmed in Sudan. Uh, this is uh, with an engineer in Cameroon using drones to sur for surveillance in agricultural areas. And uh, this is with uh, Joshua uh, Olatunji in Nigeria. Also, this is kind of also kind of uh, public health statistics. Uh, all right, besides that uh, network building, uh, I, uh, my colleague in Sudan, Saad Suber, proposed that we co-edit the volume. And uh, th this was very nice because I was able to uh, 
uh, exploit my contacts in other universities in Africa to get people to contribute. So uh, we took some master's theses, PhD theses, and made them into, uh, re recast them into a chapter in, in this book. This book came out uh, last year. On the right was a, was a seminar uh, that we organized also from Sudan. Uh, uh, and we also had several people across Africa contributing uh, presentations to this seminar. Uh, we've run it once. This is actually, if you look up Talk Coast DSI Africa, you'll find this on the web. It should still be there. This is actually hosted by uh, a, uh, I believe he's from uh, Ghana, but he's now at Harvard. So he he uh, got this set up and this was very nice. So it was, uh, Christopher, could you, uh, sorry to interrupt, but could you wrap it up? Thank you very much. Yes, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think that's about it. So challenge is um, the interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, the, they're very much locked into the uh, to rigid silos, and I think that's a, that's a great drawback. Uh, the, academic the academic world is separate from the industrial government world, and uh, that's, a, that's a challenge to overcome those barriers. Uh, it, and collaboration between African countries, there seems to be some kind of, there's some tentativeness there, and also between African and US faculty, uh, there's kind of an interest and also a competency mismatch. So those are the areas that I'd like to work on more, and that's it, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christopher. I really appreciate that. We can go to full screen here. If Christopher, you could stop sharing. Stop sharing, sure. Oh, okay. No worries, no worries. And we'll just go to gallery view. There we go. Well, I want to thank, uh, if everyone could um, get back on video, that would be great so that we can, everybody can see each other. Wonderful, Sarah Santiago. We're missing you. Um, great, great. I'm going to uh, ask a few questions. Some of them drawn from uh, from the Q and A box, and I want to thank uh, all attendees for for doing that. We're going to run a little bit late, but uh, I get to do that because uh, um, it's my fault. Uh, I took some of your time at the beginning of this, so I'll hope to pay it back. Um, uh, Clara, let's start. Uh, let's start with you. Um, Learning English can be a, a life-changing and, and career-changing experience for many students overseas. I understand the, the context within California. I wonder if, if you're sensing the same kind of culture wars, the same kind of language wars overseas, uh, say in Colombia, as you're seeing here in the United States. Uh, is there a resentment toward learning English or, uh, or, or are those conflicts uh, not as important overseas? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I, I felt very rushed my presentation. I never had a chance to end it. So thank you for that question. Uh, it felt very, very rushed. Um, and, and apologies. We've jammed too many people into one, yes. uh, one thing. So apologies for that. But go ahead. Take your time. So, so just briefly, um, uh, countries that at English as an added value or an asset, an economic asset, have a very different uh, uh, approach to the acquisition of English or the, uh, or the, the learning of English. Uh, in general, my experience in both Central and Latin America, at least just focusing on Costa Rica and Colombia, is that uh, bilingualism is uh, the privilege of the elite. Mm -hmm. uh, bilingualism is the privilege of a few. It is not bilingualism for all. It's not viewed as something that all Colombians should have a right to. Uh, language and bilingualism is not viewed as a right. It's viewed as a resource that will gain, you know, marketability and economic integration for Colombia. I have visited bilingual schools, all of them, most, most of them private, high affluence uh, schools where parents are paying uh, considerable amounts of money to have their children become bilingual. Uh, in Costa Rica, I have not had the same experience. In Costa Rica, I think that they are in the very initial stages of educational policy and the government is uh, trying to more uh, firmly and more assertively begin to look at how do we resource the country to provide access to English. In the United States, uh, to, the, to the contrary, there has been a historical neglect of educational policy in terms of the, um, em embracing the multilingual, multicultural diversity of our nation. Uh, we have treated language as a threat. We have treated language as a problem. 
uh, language uh, others than English have become a problem and a threat to the dominance and hegemony of English as such. It's a highly monolingual uh, country, which is really um, a, a sad um, state of affairs, given that we have such rich diversity of languages in this country, but we have not proactively utilized either federal policy, state policy, or educational policy at the local level to promote and to um, enhance the bilingualism, multiculturalism of so many of our students. And there is also, just to, to finish the answer, another phenomenon that is happening right now, which is the gentrification of uh, bilingual education and, and multilingual education in California, where if white Anglo-Caucasian white um, students become bilingual, biliterate, they are applauded and celebrated, and there is tremendous uh, excitement about that. However, when uh, language minority students uh, like myself are racialized, we're racialized language minority students, regardless of what languages we learn, our bilingualism is viewed as a problem, is viewed as a, as a, a problem that needs to be fixed and as a handicap and a deficit, is not viewed as an asset or as a uh, additive bilingual, you know, uh, uh, position. So the racialized, uh, the racialized bilingual minorities have experienced bilingualism in this country in a very different way from from the dominant white and local Asian uh, population. Thank you very much. I um, I'm going to go to Santiago and then to Sarah. Uh, because these are the three uh, presentations that, of course, connect to bilingualism and, and identity. So, Santiago, I wonder if you could pick up on what Clara had to say. You could comment on, on that. I'd also, as, as an addendum, if you could add something about how best practices, as the, as the kinds you're describing, could better be shared internationally. I can, uh, it's wonderful it's being shared nationally, but wondering cross borders. But uh, if you could comment on her statement and then move to that, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, John. You read my mind, actually, because I did want to piggyback on what Dr. Clara said. Uh, you know, being from Colombia and living in Colombia uh, almost all my life, I have actually experienced uh, the exact same issues that Dr. Clara has mentioned. And um, I think not that not only is English seen as an asset in Colombia, but sometimes it can also be viewed as a problem, uh, especially when you consider that, uh, for instance, the word bilingualism is so problematic for so many people who are already bilingual, you know? There are many uh, indigenous communities in Colombia whose first language is an indigenous language, and then they're bilingual because they speak Spanish as their sec second language. And so for them, you know, like, what is bilingualism to them? So it's definitely a problem when you see the hegemony of English over other languages. And so that I think also creates this huge problem in, in Colombia. And you can see it also in the, the policies that the, the Colombian government has. For instance, we have the um, Plan Nacional de, Bilingual, de Bilinguismo, the Bilingualism National Plan, which says that all the population in Colombia has to be bilingual by certain year. And it's always like pushed uh, forward because it can never be attained, especially because, you know, teachers are not proficiency. They lack the, the methodologies. They lack so many things that should be necessary for effective language teaching and also ling language learning. And um, I'm sorry, I forgot. The second, forgot question the second question was about best question. practices, <laughs> sharing best practices across borders. Yeah, so definitely like being engaged in this kind of events, like academic, academic events, conferences, uh, so that we can share and shed a light over the problems that we have in our country. And uh, in terms of best practices, uh, I think it is very important for English teachers um, to be aware of these, um, these issues so that, you know, we can, uh, better address language teaching in a way that, that doesn't ignore people who have already like an indigenous language. Um, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Sarah, to, to you, if you could build on the, the momentum these two have, have established, I, I'd also like to hear about racial, the sort of racial overtones or undertones uh, within the Netherlands, because as Clara has pointed out, this is complicated. It's not just about which language or um, because bilingualism is very common in the Netherlands, right? Mostly with English. 
but it's something about other languages and other peoples, especially those people of color. So if you could comment on, on that, that would be helpful. Um, sure. Um, well, we know that there's something called status planning in terms of language, well, there's language education policy, and then there's also language planning. And um, we see that what you're speaking about, I think, is the status of different languages. If you're bilingual in Dutch and English, that holds a different status than if you're bilingual in Arabic and Dutch, for example. And I think that Dr. Claire has talked about that and, and Santiago as well. Um, and so the value, there's a different value placed on bilingualism based on which languages you are, in which languages you are bilingual. Um, I think that this pipeline that I was speaking about ends up funneling a lot of students of color or multilingual students into the lowest tracks, uh, what well, lowest, I, I, I don't think that the tracking system is effective or uh, uh, positive at all, but uh, for the sake of understandability, the lowest track in the Netherlands ends up being a, a place with, uh, with a very multilingual, a very diverse place um, that is not valued, that is, that is actually looked down upon. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually not sure if I'm answering your question. No, no, you are. It's, it, you're, do, you're doing just fine. I, yeah. I think it's uh, these issues. To me, we could do an entire conference on on bilingualism and racism, and uh, and in fact, as we think about next year's conference, I definitely want to think about that. So I hope the three of you will stay in touch with us, with my colleague Alicia Montague, who is the director for national events. Let's think. Let's keep thinking through this. I want to be inclusive of Yasser and Christopher, though, in the few minutes that we have left. Yasser, I wonder if you could comment um, more specifically on the future of teletherapy um, and telemedicine generally. Uh, obviously, a lot of this has been developed in the uh, in the context of COVID, as as your experience shows. But what do you think happens next? Um, this is um, this is an important. Uh, resource for people, especially those who have few resources or uh, located remotely. Yeah, it's true, and it's becoming part of our practice because, uh, to our wonder, uh, some uh, uh, clients asked uh, even after the lockdown was left, uh, they asked for uh, just coming for a, an evaluation session, then continuing online all through the, the whole process. So they did, uh, I think it, it, it is part of, of our practice now. I, I had though a comment on what the colleagues said, uh, colleagues said about uh, bilingualism. I did uh, encounter that problem when I was a young Fulbrighter, in fact. Uh, everybody uh, noted my accent and although um, I can write research and books in Arabic and English, uh, that was a, a sort of a weakness for me. Getting back to the telepractice, I think it is there and it will continue to be for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher, uh, you've raised uh, uh, educational equity issues that are incredibly important. I, uh, there are a number of questions on the Q&A that, that are sort of driving it. What can we do to help? Um, uh, what are next steps, for example, that the Fulbright community could be involved with? Um, you know, you've, you've painted a, a picture that is um, that is uh, complex and um, and challenging. What what should we do next? By the way, those of you who are coming on to the next panel, if you could, there you go. Um, uh, there we go. We're get, we have a bit of a traffic jam here. Go ahead, Christopher. Tell us uh, what you think we should be doing. Well, you know, there's a language program called Each One Teach One. I think it began in the Philippines, and I think that's how it that. I don't have any grand solutions. Uh, you just you just impact people one at a time. I think if if everybody has that idea, then the impact is going to spread. That's really all I can say. Yeah, and I think that's actually a, a fitting way to end this conversation because uh, each of you, in your own ways, and all of us in our set, disparate ways, are trying to build those one-on-one -on -one relationships. Sometimes these meta problems are so overwhelming when, in fact, Christopher has proposed a very Fulbright type answer. Yeah, okay, start with one person, one relationship, one teacher, one student, help them 
and and do your best. Uh, so I want to thank all of you. I'm 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 sorry we we were so rushed. Uh, we'll this is one of those feedback moments for us as an organization to try to unpack and. Uh, and make this a little less crowded. Um, please stay in touch with each other. I urge everyone to put into the chat uh, contact information, um, Clara, Christopher, Yasser, Santiago, Sarah, if there are any things, any resources that you'd like to leave behind in the chat or simply share with us uh, and we can share with the community later, we greatly appreciate that. In the meantime, I, I wish everybody well and uh, we'll, we'll take a short break here until our next panel, which starts at 5.15. And again, thank you so, so much. <laughs>